everybody. How is uh, everybody doing on this fine Memorial Day Friday? I'm Gary Berger of Berger Law. I'm here to do a Ask a Lawyer show that we've been doing for a few weeks now during this uh, COVID corona uh, pandemic. We thought it would be a good idea for folks who have legal questions to have an avenue to answer to ask them. And uh, so to that end, we've been doing this, uh, I've been doing this show uh, from uh, my home, uh, as you can see with the open closet door over my right shoulder. So, uh, so uh, and I thought because it is Memorial Day, um, I thought it would be a good idea to do a little red, white, and blue here. So I got my red and white, red and uh, red, white, and blue bow tie. Uh, and my red coat and my blue uh, pocket hanky here. So um, uh, I dress like this every day at home. This is how I do. I get up, I put on a, a nice suit, I put on a bow tie, and I proceed to go about my day. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I've had a, a bunch of issues come up uh, this week um, um, and, uh, and I wanted to address a number of questions that clients have asked me, and I see we're already getting questions on the show, but let me just quite cut right to the questions. Uh, ask, ask a lawyer. So um, my, my uh, client that I was talking to earlier today asked me about how to resolve and pay medical bills out of a settlement. So sometimes in cases, the medical bills end up being very big and the limits of liability of insurance is smaller. So let's say you get in a car wreck and you have $25,000 in bills, but the total, total, the minimum coverage in Missouri is $25,000. So that's the most you're gonna get, even, and you have to fight for it. So we have a case where we had to fight for it and, it, and the money was, was um, uh, divided up. Um, so both Missouri and Illinois and many other states have a, what's called a lien reduction statute, which, mean, which says that if an, if an insurance company or if a medical care provider, hospital nurse, uh, pain doctor, chiropractor, whoever wants to get paid out of a case, they can only take so much money. Um, so typically after attorney's fees and expenses in Missouri, half the money would go to the injured person and half the money would go pro rata to all the bill collectors. So let's say a person gets a net $15,000 out of a settlement, then they would get $7,500 and then all their bill collectors have to split $7,500. So we've had many cases where I've told clients, you know what, one of the real benefits I can provide to you, I may not be able to get any more than the insurance policy limits. In fact, I may need to fight to get there. Some people think, hey, there's $100,000 limits, that's gonna be easy to get. Well, sometimes it's harder than you think, which is why we fight so hard, do depositions and in trial and uh, and that kind of stuff, and the litigation side of it to prove our case, to persuade the other side of the wisdom of our position. But let's say we are able to settle it, and the example I was given, then what I say is what I can offer you is I can assist you or, or, or help you get rid of your medical bills out of this. So I can't get any more than the policy limits of 25, 50, 100, 500, whatever it is. But what I can do is I can make all the bills go away. And we've had a number of folks that have written me letters or Google reviewed us or whatnot and thanked me profusely for at least being able to alleviate that medical debt. Missouri statute and Illinois statute is a little bit different. In Missouri, after, so we get, we, we, and I lecture on this. In fact, I'm doing a CLE to teach other lawyers on June 19th some of my strategy and some of my techniques and tricks about reducing liens. Um, so after we do, after we settle the case, we use a lien reduction statute. I'm not going to tell you all of my tricks on this video um, and on this live show, but we use the lien reduction statute and then, then we pay all these providers. We send them a letter saying, this is all you get. And we're transparent. We send them, here's the distribution, here's the breakdown, here's what you get. And then you're done under this statute. You can't get any more money. Now, Illinois isn't as strong. In Illinois, you can use the lien reduction statute, but the bill collector still can go sue the tort fees, or excuse me, still can go sue our client for to get the medical debt back. So it's not a, Illinois doesn't have the teeth that Missouri has in terms of being able to uh, wipe the slate clean and they can't go back and get any more money for you. That was a question that I dealt with from a client early today and I thought it would be assistive to everybody here. Then the other, the other, the other question that I had earlier today 
Um, and again, I'm getting too old. I can't remember back too far, but today I can remember the questions that were asked me. As a client and I had a discussion about comparative fault. What does that mean? Well, let's say you're in a slip and fall accident. Let's say that you injure yourself and you make a claim against a business owner or somewhere where you you were a guest and your damages are X. Well, they can say you're partially at fault. And in the end at the trial, we call it comparative fault where the jury assesses fault. Uh, 50% to you, 50% to the building owner. 75% to the building owner, 25% to you. Some, you know, you know, you give a right variety of examples. What happens in those cases is your 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 recovery, your damages are multiplied by the the or reduced by your fault or multiplied by the fault of, of the defendant. So if you're if the jury if you try a case and you prove to the jury that your damages are a hundred thousand dollars, but you're fifty percent at fault, you end up getting fifty thousand dollars. Now the judge does the reduction, the jury does not, and the jury is so instructed on that. So those are two questions that came up to me today uh, with some of my clients uh, that I thought I would ask. So can I, let me, let, me, let me answer some more questions that I see popping up on my feed here. Uh, can I sue if my business, let me ask, uh, can I sue if my business closed because of the COVID-19 outbreak? Um, well, who are you going to sue? So the answer is yes. Um, you can't sue China or the lab in North Korea that supposedly created this virus or whatever the other silly stories, silly stuff going around the, the internet is. But, but if you had an insurance policy with your uh, commercial liability carrier, uh, I have a business, I have a, I have a, I have a, because I'm my, my landlord, it requires that I have a, a policy to cover me and I have a policy to cover certain losses in my law firm. A lot of other businesses have this. Restaurants have it, uh, uh, you name it. Um, a lot of, all these, all businesses have commercial policies. You have, uh, likely have business interruption insurance. And what that means is the insurance companies have a provision that they will pay you your business income or your lost business income, net income usually, um, because if certain things happen. And what's typically called in an insurance policy is uh, physical loss and damage, end quote, right? So, so and, and we, one of the areas that I practice law in is insurance coverage. And we've made many claims over many years against insurance companies where they have denied claims to folks, whether it's property damage, whether it's uh, long-term disability, health insurance, whether it's uh, liability insurance coverage, you name it. So I often joke that insurance companies are in the business of collecting, pre collecting premiums and denying claims. So they're, they're gonna, they can deny these claims, rightfully or wrongfully, then it's up to hire a lawyer who knows the insurance law and can sue them in a declaratory judgment or some type of action, breach of contract actually, because an insurance agreement is a contract, is a breach of contract claim and you would have that claim. So bringing you back now to the COVID analysis. So if you have a claim for business interruption insur insurance, so that if your business is interrupted because of a, 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 a hurricane, a tornado, um, the, the, the state decides to close your restaurant, or if, there's, there's, if, you're, if you're a restaurant and there's some type of a food infection or something then you have a business interruption claim. Some, I also have clients who have claims for communicable disease coverage. Uh, sometimes buildings have that. Sometimes restaurants have that. Sometimes people have government action coverage. So what if the government comes in and says, we're going to take this land for an airport? Um, do you still have to pay rent if you're not allowed to occupy that? What if you don't get an occupancy permit? There's all kinds of ways that this can happen. People insure against that. We insure to spread risk. That's the point of insurance. So you may have a claim. You don't have a claim against anybody who caused the virus. You likely don't have a claim against anybody who infected you because that's hard to trace. You need to prove causation. But however, you, you can have a business interruption claim. We have a page on our website, business interruption claims. Um, and so, um, so it, would be a, it would be a claim. Now here, here's, how you, here's how you make that claim. Number one, have business interruption insurance. Get your policy, read your policy. You don't have your policy, ask your agent, send your policy. Make sure you got it. Number two, make a claim. Uh, fill out the loss of the proof of loss or claim form. Submit it to your insurance company. Three, get denied, which is probably going to happen. 
um, uh, get denied and get the letter and they'll state the grounds. It'll be a long letter from a lawyer where they quote all this insurance policy mumbo jumbo and they're going to say why they deny you. Send those to me at Gary at BurgerLaw.com. I'll tell you for free whether or not I can help you. If I do help you, I'm going to charge you. I usually represent people on a contingency fee basis. So you don't get, I don't get paid until I win your case. Uh, and then we take these claims, we sue the insurance companies, and we try to go get some justice. All right, let me go to another question. Um, we got a lot of questions popping up. Um, uh, do you get nervous before depositions and trials? Usually, not in depositions, but I do during trials. Um, my one of my I, I I used to work for a great lawyer named Bill Brasher, who was one of my mentors. And when I would read his, oh, it was my when I was a puppy lawyer, he wrote the word. Whenever he wrote, whenever he had a closing argument, he wrote wrote the word relax um, in in uh, on bold. And I will be honest with you, Rodney. So when I did the Missouri Supreme Court argument about four weeks ago, I took out a post-it and I wrote two word, three words on a post-it and put it right next to the camera on my, on my monitor. I wrote the word relax and I wrote the word slow down because I can talk really fast, uh, especially when I get nervous. So I try to tell myself, and I don't know if I looked at the sign, but I don't get nervous. I do depots all the time. It's, and I, a lot of times in trials, I don't get nervous because it's kind of, it's my fun thing to do. I enjoy doing that. So I get nervous before the night before, but when I'm in the heat of the battle, it goes away. It's just like like if like if I was running a cross country race or a wrestling match, or you know, everybody does sports. You know, when we're growing up, um, you know, before that meet, you're nervous. You're nervous. How am I going to do? Blah blah blah. But when you're in the heat of the battle, you don't get nervous. When you're running or wrestling or playing tennis or football or soccer, or whatever, you're having fun. That's when you're, that's your sweet spot. That's when you enjoy what you're doing. So it's, you know, and, and you know what Tom Petty says, the waiting is the hardest part. I'd sing it. The waiting is the, I'm not going to sing it for you, but the waiting is the hardest part. That's what gives you the stress or the anxiety. And you know, uh, and this is, this COVID pandemic is affecting people and giving people stress or anxiety as well. Let me see the next question. And can I do a shout out to my Today, on May 22nd, is my little son William's second birthday. He's the cutest kid. He's a joy to my life. Not just as cute as my other kids, but he's kind of more cute now. Actually, my older kids aren't as cute right now. Uh, they're cute till about, what, say seven or eight, and then they kind of lose their cuteness. Um, they're still great. We still love them, but they're differently cute. Uh, so happy birthday, William. We're going to celebrate that. That's why we're doing this a little bit earlier today. Um, Brennan Girdler. Brennan has the greatest questions. Uh, how come, Brennan, didn't you ask me another uh, finger-off case? Here, here's what Brennan asks. Um, I don't get how losing a finger is worth something different than losing a toe. Wouldn't my toe be worth more if I didn't... Um, have a finger to begin with, et cetera. It all seems strange. Well, it depends, Brennan, on how ugly your toes are. Most people don't, aren't foot people. I guess there's a, some people are foot people. Um, but, um, so you're, you know, so it is strange. You, sh you know, it's even stranger. Here's even stranger. If you ever look up the, go, if you ever Google the uh, Missouri Workers' Compensation um, uh, 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 chart for how they pay people. We do a lot of work comp cases, and I call it the, the chart, but if you Google or go to the Missouri Department of, uh, uh, Missouri, uh, Department of Labor, uh, their website, they'll, you'll, get, you'll get the chart, and they will tell you, like if you, they will tell you how many weeks you get if you cut off your, hand, your finger here versus here versus here, and then they do it. They literally say, if you cut off your finger here, that's different than here and here. Um, and where, where you would lose a limb or whatever your le level of disability is, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, precise and pretty, pretty um, also it's pretty um, 
random. It's pretty a pretty pretty random decision so that they made. So, but people use their hands, their digits for more. You do you use your hand for working, especially your your dominant hand versus non-dominant hand, your thumb, which is your opposing digit, versus your finger, uh, versus your primary finger, versus your pinky. Um, so all those are different fingers. Uh, uh, we know that. Duh. That's a, about the stupidest thing. All these are different fingers, but all these have different uses in our everyday life. We use them all the time, but some are more important than others. Toes are different than others. Um, uh, two, you know, your your big toe may be different than your pinky toe. So it's just basically, it's kind of common sense. Like, if you say, I don't get losing a finger is worth something different than losing a toe. Well, if you said, like, let's say you're in uh, that um, Reservoir Dogs a movie and they're torturing you and they're going to, you know, if they say, hey, would you rather me cut off your thumb or your pinky toe? Well, you know what? You're going to go for the pinky toe. So that, that answers your question. Carrie Cato. Carrie asks, do I have options? I don't mean to call you out or anything, um, Carrie, but do I have options to sue if I was in a hit and run? Um, yeah, you do. So if you're driving, you can sue your uninsured motorist policy. So everybody who has insurance in Missouri, Illinois, and every other state has uh, automatic buy statute. The insurance company has to provide you uninsured motorist coverage. And that uninsured motorist coverage provides coverage for a hit and run. So if someone hit, rear ends you, side swipes you, injures you, and leaves, and you don't get the information, call your, in, when you call, and you're gonna call and make a claim on your insurance anyway. So you, when you call them, you say, not only do I want the property insurance claim, but I want to make an uninsured claim on my own insurance company, my own insurance policy. Some people say, hey, I don't want my rates to go up. Well, you know what? Make the claim, get the money for your injury, and then see if your rates go up. Sometimes they don't go up. And if they are gonna go up, switch insurance companies. I was with an insurance company for like 20 years, and I didn't, and I was just looking to change and stuff. And I saved so much money by changing. I didn't even think about it. So it's kind of like cable, you know. Every once in a while, call your cable company and threaten to change companies, and all of a sudden your rate will go down, or your phone company, your cell phone. Same is true with your with your car insurance. So make the claim. Don't skirt or not take the claim because you're afraid your rates are going to go up. Make that. Now the other thing is you could try to get the license plate and report it. Here's a couple of things, Carrie, that you do if you are in a hit and run. Call the police, get a police report. You don't want to not do that and then make a claim against the insurance company and then they say, hey, oh, you didn't even make a police report? Are you making this up? How do we know you didn't just back into the back into a brick wall and you're making this whole deal up? So you want to um, you want to uh, you want to get a police report, take pictures. If it's I was in I was in a hit and run personally last year. Someone hit me, rear-ended me on, on 270, and then they tried to run, but it was traffic, and I drive, I happened to drive a fast car, so I chased them, and my wife was like, don't chase them, I, she may be watching now. And, and I did chase them for a little while. They stopped at a light, I went out, I took a picture of their license plate, and then I let them go, because I'm sitting there chasing them, going, why am I chasing these people? What am I gonna do, who cares? I called the police, I pulled over, the St. Louis City Police were fantastic. They met me in the Emos parking lot, the one Emos right in the corner, Highway 40. They came and took a report. I actually found her. So what I did was, so in the picture that I took, I, I, I sent this to my investigator. I said, can you track this license plate for me? It was a temp tag, Illinois tag. And he said, you know what, in the picture, up in the corner, I didn't see it, you can see up in the corner, there was the picture of the car dealership where this lady had bought her car. So I called the car dealership, I'd used my lawyer voice, I threatened them a little bit, and they gave me her name and number, so I sued her. So I sued her in Illinois court, she never answered the summons or the subpoena, and I'm, that case is still sitting there. I can get a default judgment, but I'm not gonna get any money from against her. So you know what I did? I called my own insurance company. I made an uninsured motorist claim. I'm, I sent them my medical bills and records, and frankly, I need to follow up on that and settle it. I did go to the chiropractor for a while. David Clyde, David, good to see you. How are you, sir? I like your photo you took, David, on Facebook, that new camera you have on your and these new cameras on these phones amazing the, the the quality you got some of the shadowing on that rock day but it was pretty amazing good work uh, you should you should go into photography if an employer requests their employees to return back to work in a shared space while following all the guidelines put in i'm touching 
in place by St. Louis authorities and an employee contracts COVID-19, can they sue or have a case? Asking for a friend. David runs a business and is probably considering that. David, so if anybody wants the, my new policy on when we reopen our firm, email me, Gary at I'll, I'll send it to you. I do a marketing email, David. It was, on, it was contained in my email I sent about 7.30 this morning to a few thousand of my closest friends. So, number, so, so if anybody who's watching has an interest in seeing what a model policy for returning to work is, I'll give you mine and, and you all can steal it. Um, secondly, David, the answer is they have, your employees would have a workers' compensation claim against you. So if you're reopening any business, David or, David or anybody's, David at Orange Design, orangedesign.com, any great marketing uh, SEO folks, um, if anybody has, so when you reopen, if you get COVID and you can show that work exposure was the prevailing factor, we talked about workers' compensation returns with terms of, I said, look it up in the Missouri Department of Labor, uh, uh, labor.mo.org, um, about the, where your fingers cut off or whatever. They also have, stand, that's, that's also work comp, so workers' compensation claims. So all the standards and guidelines are in there. I think the Missouri Division of Labor made a decision that COVID-19 infection would be considered a covered illness for workers' compensation. They did an administrative order, but you still have to prove that the claimant, the employee, still has to prove that um, that it that the work place exposure or the workplace injury was the prevailing factor in the illness. Because if your employee is out dancing the night away and doing all that late night, like if Brennan's out, let me use a very specific example. If Brennan's out hitting the bars hard every night and hugging everybody, um, then, and he comes to work late, right? Um, if he comes to work late, then, um, then he probably got it at the bars, not at your, not your place. You, everybody's separated. You have really nice space on Washington Avenue. He's probably got it at the bars, not from um, uh, one of your other, Davey or Umi or you or something. So, um, so he's got to prove it's a prevailing factor. So to have a workers' compensation claim for your business or anybody, you got to prove that it's a prevailing factor, that the workplace exposure is a prevailing factor. That's the standard. you got to get an expert to do it. I fight this all the time. My friend Jennifer... My coworker and great friend Jennifer Zinni asks, if I signed a consent form before surgery, have I waived my rights to a medical malpractice case? Wow, that is, I gotta really talk fast. I got a lot to pack in on that one. So um, there's different types of medical malpractice cases. One type of a medical malpractice case is an informed consent case. In an informed consent case, you allege that the doctor or medical provider failed to provide you informed consent to the procedure. For instance, if they didn't tell you that in a back surgery, if they didn't tell you that you could become paralyzed, because you can become paralyzed in a back or a neck surgery, um, then you may have a claim. I very rarely take informed consent medical malpractice cases because the consents that are usually done the form consents are usually pretty thorough and doctors usually do, do a pretty good job. It's not, you don't go into back surgery with one little 10 minute conversation with your doctor. It's usually more informed. And then you have a causation problem. So medical malpractice cases usually are involve a breach of the standard of care than where the doctor was negligence. They didn't look before they cut. They forgot to, they gave you the wrong medication. They gave you the wrong dose of a medication. They, um, failed to, there's a whole host of things. They, they knew you had an infection for a year and never gave you antibiotics. They knew you had a mass on your, on your liver and they never checked to see if it was cancer or something. I mean, you know, so those are, those are breaches of the standard of care. Um, but your question, I'm reading your question again, I'm sorry. If you sign the consent, if you did sign the consent, no, you don't waive your medical malpractice case. Let me answer that question better. No. However, Here's something interesting. So Wash U and some other providers have mandatory arbitration provi provisions in some of the documents. So let's say you go get treated at a doctor and in one of the many forms you signed, you signed an arbitration provision. So do you, get, and that means you can't go to a jury trial. That means you waive your right under the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution to have a jury trial. You have to go to some random arbitrator that you don't know. 
So you have some single old, usually they're old white guys. Usually you have some single, one single old white guy deciding your case instead of a jury of 12 people of your peers. So you don't, if you sign a consent form before surgery, you don't waive your medical malpractice case, but you may, you have, you have, you have to be concerned because you may have waived, you may have, have some secret arbitration provision. So if you ever have that, cross it out. Say you, you could, let's say you have a form and there's 30 things and you don't agree to one, cross it off. Um, uh, whenever you go, you go skiing, you go ice, you go roller skating, you go to a you go to a gymnastics thing for your kid or a climbing gym. You got to sign the waiver. Well, you're signing away your rights. There, you are signing away your rights, and those contracts are enforced. You know where they're especially enforced in every state where there's a mountain where people ski. Then the law is really tough. They also have good orthopedic surgeons though in those places. You're kind of random, so not random uh, because people hurt themselves. So. Um, but here, here's here's a trick. One, a lawyer friend of mine did uh, uh, did, did did one time. He he would cross it off and he would write on there, um, uh, I waive I waive all my rights except for your negligence. So if you ever want a trick, you can write I waive all my rights against you except if you're negligence negligent, which is the only right you have anyway to sue them. So it's kind of a clever way. And they think, oh, fine, that's great. And that's the only reason you're going to be able to uh, sue them in the first instance. Je uh, everybody's saying happy birthday to William. Thank you very much. William is such a, we're about to go have cake and he sings happy birthday and he's the cutest kid. So thank you very much. I, that's probably going to be the highlight of the, the, of the show here is me talking about my awesome kid, William, who's super cute. Um, at what point in the course of a motor vehicle accident claim should I contact an attorney? Kira, good question. So, usually right away. If you're really hit, if you're, if you're, uh, I did an email this morning about my friend Randy Overy. We settled his case for three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. There's a video up on my site about it. He went out and he took. He did great. There are a couple of great things Randy did in his case. One is he got out of the car and he took pictures on the highway safely. He got safe and stuff, but he got smashed. He ended up getting neck surgery, multi-level fusion. He went out and he got, he took, he, he, he got pictures. The second thing is he called us right away. Uh, Randy knows and, 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 and he's been down. I've tried a case with Randy in Jefferson County. We had a verdict of $142,000 about six or seven years ago. Um, so you think that, and, and so there's a couple of things you want to do in a motor vehicle accident. Take pictures, Get witness names, call the police. You'd be surprised how many times you think all these witnesses are there. We literally have it right now. This, we did a deposition two weeks ago and this young lady was like, all these people were here, they saw that the truck, the tractor trailer ran the red light and they were all there and the cop, and we get the police report and none of them are in the police report. Get the witness names yourself, take pictures yourself, go get medical attention. And then, then contact a lawyer. Contacting a lawyer is free, Kara. So you can always contact a lawyer for free. I only charge you if I get it, if I win a case for you at the end, if I get the money that you're entitled to. So there's no charge to call it and to, to do that. And lawyers like me, and there's a lot of great lawyers out there that are, that are straight shooters, but lawyers will tell you, hey, listen, Kira, you need a lawyer. They're gonna fight this one. They're gonna say that you stopped suddenly on the highway. They're gonna say that you, it was a he said, she said on whether the light was red or green. They're gonna do this, that, or the other thing. And you'd be surprised. I literally have um, a case that I'm trying to settle right now where I was literally telling, today, literally today, telling telling Josh, I was saying, and the other lawyer in the case, I was saying, you know, these, these folks come and they say, I don't know if I really need you, but um, I don't know kind of what I'm doing and I need some guidance. And then two years later when we're fighting cats, you know, do, uh, like cats and dogs over, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 grand more in a settlement, they're like, thank God I got you. Remember when I came in and I said I didn't know if I needed you? Thank God. And I tell, told this to the client I today, today. I said, remember when you weren't really sure if you needed me and you like we're like three weeks away from trial and they're finally ponying up money when I am about to go take the doctor's depositions, video evidence depositions for trial. You know how that works? So that, I think I answered your question. Um, Brennan asked me, uh, let's see, thanks everybody for watching. I see a lot of watch, watching. Um, I have a question from uh, Adam Houston. Um, and what I try to do in these, oh, you know what I didn't do, folks? I, I Before I get to Adam's question, two things. 
One is I try to, rather than talking about me or what I'm interested in, and I do that a little bit, uh, certainly, but I wanna, f I wanna hear what y'all are interested in and what questions are in your mind and what you want free legal help on, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. Secondly, I forgot to do this in the beginning of this show, but I would like to announce the winner of our $150 Instacart giveaway um, we, every week we're giving away a $150 gift certificate, no strings attached to help our friends in this time of need, help them get some meals on the table. Uh, and we post that every week on the Burger Law Facebook page and people who like or comment on it are in the running and then we choose them. You don't have to like our Burger Law page. We're not asking for anything in return. This is a pure giveaway to try to help out. We're so blessed by the great community of friends that we have who, who support us that we this one's for free uh, for sure. Um, our, uh, enough said, our winner this, this week is Maunita Smith. Maunita, I think I'm not pronouncing that right. M-A-U-N-I-T-A -A Smith. Uh, I saw your Facebook profile. You're, you're a sweet lady. S uh, such a blessing to get to know you a little bit, even in this, you know, socially on social media in this virtual world, we're not, we're not really sitting having a coffee or, or our lemonade or anything like that. So what we're going to do, Manita, is we will message you. All we need from you is your zip code. And then we're going to send you this and then we'll send you a code and you'll put that, put it on your phone and you got $150 from Burger Law to, um, to order some food by Instacart. And I wish you and your family a very safe and healthy, uh, uh weathering of this pandemic. Let me, um, now, uh, get to Adam's question. Adam asks, I hired a friend of a friend to fix my roof. He gave me a warranty where he said he would fix any leaks at no cost for the next five years. But after about three years, it leaked and I couldn't get him to return a call. Is it worth suing or do I just let it go? The answer is let it go because there is something called, and now I'm going to assume some facts, Adam. Number one is, I'm assuming you didn't have a writ, written agreement with him. So if, 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 so under the law, warranties have to be in writing to avoid the statute of frauds. And what the statute of frauds says, and this is true in any state, it's a state law, it's a common law, but it says that that it, it's a law that's put in place to prevent people from making bogus claims about oral contracts down the road. So, so if you have a contract that is that takes longer than six months to perform, or is over like ten thousand dollars, it has to be in writing. So, if I agree to you, Adam, if I agree with you to come fix your roof in a year, and I tell you fifty times that I'm going to do it, it ain't worth. It ain't, it's, it, it's, you can't enforce it. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. If I say uh, I'm going to do something for you next week and that you are going to, um, and that, and that you pay me for it. I got a contract because you paid me 500 bucks to come out and fix your, fix your roof. I went on my roof the other day and cleaned out all my gutters and did all my stuff. So I've done roof work. That's hard work. I get why you'd want to hire someone. Um, maybe I should, I shouldn't hire him, but I should hire somebody. So don't sue him. It's a waste of your time and money. Um, uh, and I would not do it. I'd move on. Your money is better spent getting a real roofer in who's going to have a contract and do it. For a contract, if you're hiring someone to do something, Adam, and anybody else, because I don't want to single you out just because you asked the question, because I've done this too. I mean, I like you kick yourself. You're like, you know what? I should have known. And it's the one time when you don't write something down. That's when you get screwed later, right? If it's all written down and stuff, then it, then it doesn't happen. It's, it's kind of like a Murphy's Law deal. So um, you, what you ought to do is you ought to put it in writing yourself. You can write your own contract. It doesn't have to be typed. You, you sit there and you write down, uh, Joe Schmo agrees to come out and do uh, any work for the next five years to repair any roof leaks. Sign it, put, have him put his name and number, then you have a contract. You don't have to sign it. So it's interesting to, to, to uh, bind another party, the, the contract has to be signed by the other person against whom you're trying to obligate it. Now you do wanna both sign it because it's mutual. You could also write in there, I'm paying you 500 bucks you're going to fix my roof and you're going to agree to repair any leaks down the road. Um, 
get a real roofer up there. There's a lot of good roofing companies. Get a couple prices. There's different. There's some roofing. You know, roofing um, vultures uh, are out there. So be careful. There's roofing companies that'll come and charge you the hell out of you, and then they subcontract it to five different people, and then two weeks later, somebody who you know got paid like a third of what you paid comes and does some crappy job. I've had cases like this. I've represented roofers. I've represented companies that have been screwed with leaks, all that kind of stuff. This roofing industry is interesting, and I'm not trying to paint with too broad a brush. All I'm saying is get a couple bids because you don't want to overpay. You don't want to over. You don't want to overpay. You don't want to overpay and have underperformance. If a corrections a Tiffany asks if a corrections officer gets COVID contracts COVID nineteen from being exposed to work, but is too scared to go back after they recovered. Do they have any rights to not go back until their employer puts proper protocol in place? And if they don't go back, are there special circumstances put in place right now to collect unemployment? I take it, Tiffany. Tiffany is our intake, my intake manager, intake director. Um, I take it that that's an intake question that you didn't have time to ask me today. So let me try to answer this one, Tiffany. You do great work. Thank you for all you do. And um, so, number, a couple of things. One is that the corrections officer may have a claim, a work comp claim for the medical care that they received in COVID-19. Now they are not going to have any disability, permanent disability or disfigurement, from what I understand of the medicine, because once you recover from COVID, then you're fine. You don't have anything, <clears throat> any residual lasting uh, uh, disfigurement or, di or, or disability. Too scared to go back after they're recovered. The, the, the Department of Corrections, I get it. The Department of Corrections does retaliation and uh, it's a tough employer in the state of Missouri. I'm not just saying that. And don't worry folks, they can't sue me for libel or slander because there's about 20 verdicts against the 10 to 20 verdicts against the Department of Corrections for retaliation in the last 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of jury verdicts against them in employment discrimination context and other contexts. So, and they're in the paper for being a bad actor on retaliation. Now there's a lot of great, kind, nice majors and, and, and heads of these prisons that don't do that kind of stuff, that honor and, and, and support their, their officers and that are great leaders there. I don't wanna, again, I'm, I think I'm painting with too broad a brush. Um, but I get why you, why you don't wanna go back. Um, the, but you do not have a right to not work because you're afraid to get COVID. And once you've had it once, if once you've had it once, you've already had it, you can't get it again, I don't think. But it's what we think with the antibodies. Now, the, the jury's still out on that a little bit. Um, the answer is no. There's no special way to get unemployment because you don't want to go back because your employer is not safeguarding yourself. There's no way to collect money or wages um, for that. Uh, the employment law is tough. Employees don't have a lot of rights unless you're union, and we know what the Department of Corrections has done to their union this year, to MOCOA. They've refused to take out the dues from their uh, from their paychecks, which is they're trying, the state of Missouri is trying to emasculate all the state unions. That's been in the paper as well. Um, so uh, uh, the answer is no. You can't get paid and not go to work, and that's true anywhere, unfortunately. So you don't have you don't have that right. So go find another job. It's, I don't want to be crass or curt or short, but and especially in this day with the level of unemployment we have now, but. You, if you got to put food on the table, you got to go to work, and, and and I know that's hard. And and um, but maybe think about a career change for yourself to go back into another 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 job. Al Al Alona, her. Uh, uh, at what point do I consult with an attorney if I feed if I feel I need to file for disability due to degenerative back disease that has gotten too bad to continue to work? Well. Great question, Alona. Uh, Alana, Alona, I'm sorry. Um, here's what you do. Uh, first, make sure you, if you have a claim because of a back injury, so even if someone has a degenerative condition, if they like get rear-ended or something like that, then they, um, then they may have a claim 
for that for that injury. You may be able to collect money there. So just because you have a degenerative or or a condition doesn't mean that you can also you that you cannot also have an acute trauma uh, instance that you may have, be able to recover from. And then in terms of filing for disability, here's what I always say: file once yourself and get denied before you go to a lawyer. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, and so you can fill out the paperwork, do it yourself, get a letter from your doctor, fill it out, submit it to Social Security. They very well may deny it. <clears throat> it's kind of like one of those things. They deny a lot of first-time applications for the Department of Social Security, which is fine. And then, and then you can get a Social Security disability lawyer. You should call my friends, either call my friends Brad, um, gosh, Brad, or John Nelson. Call my friend John Nelson in Missouri or my friend Brad. And gosh, Brad is a great guy. I'm I can't get on my phone. I'm mind blanking on his name. Email me at Gary at BurgerLaw.com. I'll give you good Social Security disability lawyers. John Nelson's one and Brad is another one. Brad, it's your fault. You haven't, we haven't had lunch in a while and I haven't seen you around in a while. Um, <laughs> so um, email me, Gary at BurgerLaw.com. I'll give you I'll give you good Social Security disability lawyers. Here's a good, good thing about Social Security disability lawyers: their fees are capped. I think it's a max six grand they can charge per case. So um, you're not going. And there's a lot of really good uh, um, uh, Social Security disability lawyers. Crow and Shanahan's in my building. Those are good lawyers too. I just thought about them. Uh, so uh, so uh, call me if you want a good reference. I'm happy to do it. Adam Houston. I think I had a written thing, but it was fairly unprofessional looking. That's okay. Thank you, Adam, on, on your on your roofing question. Even if it's unprofessional, it doesn't matter. If it says it, it said it, and then you can do it. Um, Tiffany, William does not, I don't make him wear matching bow ties, but he and I have matching Elmo shirts. So I may have to put on my Elmo shirt later. Thanks, Adam. I see your other cam uh, your your comments. I see Jeff Winters and Elvis Cameron are watching. Those are two good old friends. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Um, Mike Sheldon, Gary, what's your favorite type of case to try? Any specific examples? I love uh, trying cases. Um, you know, the case, regardless of the facts and the types of cases, um, I one of the reasons I do what I do is because I hate bullies, and I want to stand up to them. And I see big corporations and insurance companies bullying people all the time. It's what I do every day. I try to stand up for the little guy against them. Let's try to equal the playing field, justice, balance the scales of justice. Justice is blind. That's one of the things that America was founded on. It's an ideal in our constitution and our laws. It is very important to me as a lawyer. So cases to answer the question, cases that I like to try are when those that dynamic is apparent. When I am fight, fighting for someone who has been wronged and is getting screwed over and they need a jury of their peers to come and make it right and to balance those scales of justice. And that's what I tell juries when I do it. We're here for a reason. The defendant won't take responsibility. Now they don't get to hear that the insurance company um, the, they don't get to hear that the insurance company no, never offered anything in settlement, that the lawyer is a jerk or they're being jerks or they're, or they're pushing us around, that kind of stuff. So, because um, you can't talk about settlement in front of a jury. You can't talk about settlement discussions in front of a jury. Um, so any, just, just you know, and, and I can give you examples. So that Randy Overy I talked about earlier today, Randy and I went and tried this case. He was, I put him on the stand um, I asked that I demanded the insurance company pay us 140 grand. They only offered us 100. We went and we tried it. Randy was great. The jury gave us 142. The jury called it exactly right, exactly what I thought. I've had many other cases where the verdict comes back. We get what we asked for, and the client really feels vindicated because they. You got to remember, in an accident case, the world is turned upside down. Um, they're not getting their paychecks. They're losing their houses or money. They have, they're afraid for their future. They don't know how to navigate the world, the world medically or financially. So they've been through a long slog. And then the, you know, it's, I joke with my new clients. I say, the last thing someone wants to say is, I got in an accident. I got hurt. Financially, I'm screwed. I have all this medical stuff. Now I want to have to go to a lawyer and file a lawsuit. Doesn't that sound like fun? Said no one ever, right? So no one wants to do that. So it's, it's stressful also to go through the litigation process. And um, 
Uh, that is, and it really is because you're risk averse. This is your only claim. The insurance company has a lot of claims. They don't care about you. No offense. I mean, I mean, you know that, right? So, um, uh, so it's those cases, Mike, where I can stand up and give someone the support that they need to make it equal with my, with what I can do as a lawyer. That's what I like. Um, so I'm watch, looking at some questions here on my phone. Doug Biggs, my friend Doug, how are you, sir? I hope you are well. I think you were, I was supposed to return a call to you, Doug. You had a question about a case. Doug asked the following question. Slip and fall on a slippery parking lot surface. Does the contractor who installed the surface have any liability or just the owner of the building? Yeah, the contractor who does and the owner does both. Um, so I had Doug, I, I have a good expert uh, for you. Um, I'll remember his name. Casey will remember his name. I've used him on some, some stuff and there is a, we've, we've tested slipperiness stuff because you can't have a, you can't, people park and walk on parking lots all the time. You can't have it where that surface is slick because people are going to slip, especially in the rain. You got to make a surface so they can, that's not slippery. Doug, you, we can, you, there's a slipperiness coefficient or something. You can go test that where you can hire an expert to do it. Now you have to make the, the damages have to warrant the investment of doing the expert. So you all got to remember, so we can go hire experts and stuff and lawyers do that. We use that so we can put the expert on the stand to testify about stuff scientific or other things that would help the jury, assist the jury, assist the trier of fact. But, um, it's got to warrant it because these engineers can be expensive. Doctors can be expensive. So you're not going to hire a $20,000 expert if your damages are only 10 grand. Uh, and I know Doug knows that. I'm just kind of explaining that some of the stuff we think about as lawyers. So I think they have liability, Doug. And I think you got to remember the contractor is going to have a contract with the building owner when they put it in. So there's going to be some indemnity provisions there too. There's also going to, the, the contractor though also is going to have another pot of insurance or a bond. Sometimes a contractor has a bond or an insurance policy for that specific construction um, uh, project. That contractor also may have subs who are the ones who decided the paint. You may have an architect who decided the surface type. There's a whole host of things you can get in there. I'd put them on notice. I'd send a lien letter to them or ask the owner to tell you who it is and send a lien letter. Get the owner of the building to give you the contract with the con contractor. It may all be for naught because if the contractor told, had, a, had an agreement with the owner that after the project was done, the owner had to indemnify the contractor, then you can make the claim, but it still is gonna land on the contractor. Excuse me, it's still, then it's still gonna land on the building owner. Um, but the jury doesn't know that. They don't get to see that well, unless they do a, a claim for contractual indemnity, but you could force that, and then you can get the, then the jury can know that the owner took owned it, you know, uh, and took responsibility for it. The other re the other way to, I think you got to name the contractor because otherwise you're going to have an empty chair, and you don't want the owner to just sit there and point, hey, there's a contractor, he's not here, and the plaintiff decided not to pursue a claim. So I think you kind of got to do it to avoid the empty chair, to bring in the contractual indemnity issues, to bring in the other insurance bond or the other insurance issues as well. I'd name them, see what you can do. Diane Ortball. Diane, how are you? It's good to see you watching this. Um, will you ever, will you eventually become a judge? Any interest, you'd be great. No, I don't think I will be. I'm not that, uh, I don't know if I have that kind of patience. You know, I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't have the patience. Um, that's the kind of joke that I see Phil Decker or my dad, who's a friend of my dad. That's my dad's joke, Phil, so there you go. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I, you could do it. I, I'm not against it. I don't know if I would have the patience to, I think the look on my face, rolling my eyes and going, oh yeah, right. That kind of stuff. I don't know. My mom was a judge for a long time. She did a great job. She had a personality well suited to that. And my people loved my mom as a judge. Every time I meet someone, another lawyer, everybody says, how's your mom? Everybody loves my mom a lot more than me, which is good. They should. It's, it's warranted. Um, I'm blessed to have an amazing mother and father. Um, so the answer is no. 
Uh, Doug, thanks for the great answer comment. Uh, if I, uh, I think that was what your question. If, if you were calling me about something else, Doug, give me a call. Um, just for anybody who ends up watching this later, you know, we always answer questions for people for free to lawyers too. Doug is a lawyer, a very smart lawyer with a very successful practice, Longo Biggs. They do great work. On my website, I have a lawyer to lawyer page, lawyer to lawyer, where I share my CLEs, the educational stuff, the other good stuff that I do that I like to share with lawyers. I mentioned earlier on the broadcast, I shared my firm policy on going back to work with COVID. I'm a believer in raising all ships. I don't, I don't really am looking to compete against other lawyers. I want to help other lawyers. That's not the point. We got too many uh, insurance companies and other defense lawyers and big corporations to fight, to, to, to worry about fighting with each other. So I like to, uh, I like to, to support everybody else. So, and then the public can too. If you're watching and you want to figure out what Gary's CLE on negotiating liens were or how to do an expert depot or immunity or all the myriad of other things we've, we've had, had the blessing to have great presentations on some by me, some by other folks. Um, you can always go to lawyer, Burger Law Lawyer to lawyer. And I say to lawyer because that's very different from the lawyer v. lawyer. I also, and I know it's weird, I have a page called Lawyer v. Lawyer where a friend of mine, Debbie Champion, who's a great lawyer, great defense, more of a defense lawyer, she and I have a podcast series going where over the last two years we've done a bunch of podcasts, probably 50 podcasts on different lawyer Subject. So with the Lawyer v. Lawyer is a podcast where we try to help other lawyers as well. Uh, well, I have run out of things to talk about. It's almost 4 o'clock. I've been going for an hour. I have to go celebrate my son William's second birthday. I'm so excited to do that. We're going to sing happy birthday and play games and open presents. Everybody, um, enjoy your families. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Um, let's take a minute for Memorial Day rather than just, and we know it's a three-day weekend and we have gratitude for that, but let's think and remember about all the men and women who have died for our country in the service of our country. Uh, we have Jefferson Barracks here. Um, I know I'm wearing the slightly garish red and blue, red, white, and blue, but um, Take a minute and pray. I had a friend of mine call me today and talk about prayer. And, and so whatever your, what, I don't want to, uh, whatever, whoever your higher power is, whatever you do, whether it's pause to reflect or whether it's a prayer, let's, let's take a minute and have gratitude uh, for those men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Thank you.